It was an interesting presentation. It was uh, a humorous way of looking at some of the challenges that we're facing today uh, regarding, uh, you know, green options and, and saving our environment. He had a nice way of just putting it out there and uh, enlightening us uh, with some potential positive options in the green environment. What Bob does is he, he helps people take themselves a little bit less seriously about all this stuff and I think you got to lighten up with this stuff in order to actually make it real and make something happen. And I think he did something that we really needed which is to, you know as Americans we're so often just driven by one thing, the price of fuel. What Bob really did was he brought a whole perspective of the whole problem and that we all are part of the solution and that green is part of the solution. Bob's great. Bob's a green solution. He's not part of the problem. He's, he's telling us what the problems are, and he's identifying ways to uh, to, to fix the earth and, and implement green strategies. And, and Bob's a strategy. He's a solution. When I started this whole process, I went to the bookstore, and I bought a book, A Hundred Ways to Save the Planet. hundred ways to save the planet. One of the first things it said was, buy less paper. So I returned the book. You see, this is why it's confusing. Then I was driving in the car and I was listening to this green expert on the radio and he said to remove unnecessary items from your vehicle to increase the mileage. So I pulled over and I told my friends to get out of the car and walk because I'm trying to save the planet. <laughs> the good news is though that newer kinds of bulbs are coming out like LED bulbs but if you've seen these at the store, these bulbs are very expensive. Which raises the question, how many dollars does it take to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> Recycling, you know, you can't just recycle any plastic. Oh no, you have to look on the bottom and try to decipher the number that's on the bottom to figure out if you can or can't. Now like number one and two, yes, you can recycle. Three and four, you can't. Five and six, well, it depends on the local regulations whether you can or can't. And then it also has to be clear plastic, it has to be white plastic, it has to have a long neck and a narrow mouth. So here's my question, what happens if you're trying to recycle and you have a number two container with a number four lid with no neck and a wide mouth? What do you do? <laughs> it's confusing. How about the green bathroom? There's some challenges there, right? We have the low flow shower. Have you tried one of these where you're standing there trying to catch droplets of water and <laughs> fly to your skin so you can work up a lather with the soap? And then we have the low flow toilet. Well, actually, all new toilets now are low flow. It's instead of seven gallons, they only use one and a half gallons to flush, which is good for the planet, right? But have you tried using these? Sometimes they don't really work. You know, you flush it and you look down and you go, I don't think that's going to go down. I don't think it's going to work. So suddenly you end up, you're flushing several times, and this only happens when you're at somebody else's house, and they're yelling, is everything okay up there? Yeah, I'm fine. It's your low-flow toilet that's not working. So as much as it can be somewhat confusing about going green, it's something we really need to do. Because, I mean, don't we want to leave a cleaner, greener planet for our children? and for future generations. And there are steps that we can all do that we'll talk about this morning. Some of them are more of a challenge, some of them kind of easy, the more you find out about it. So let's talk about how we got to this point. Let's go back to the very beginning when dinosaurs were roaming the earth and they were vegetarian, which gave them terrible gas, which heated up the planet, and that caused global warming right there. <laughs> and their extinction. By the 12th century, however, there was a huge advertising campaign for clean coal. And they said not only was it cheap and abundant, and yes, it did burn dirty, but they were working on a way to make it clean, and within a few years they were sure that it would be clean. Now, you know, we are 900 years later, but they're still working on it, and they claim they are getting close. <laughs> By the 1970s, we had the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, and they were given the mission to regulate pollution into the atmosphere from business. Well, the consultants stepped in. Oh, they saw a great opportunity. So they created this environmental management systems, and they were proposing 
things like buzzwords, demanufacturing, end-of-life management, and their absolute favorite, renewable and sustainable consulting. That's the one that they focused on the most. In the 1990s, concern about global warming really captured public attention with the landmark British Nicker study. And as you can see, conclusive proof that the planet definitely was getting hotter. People said, OK, we've made all these advances. How can we tie this all together? We need somebody to come to the rescue and really save the planet and bring it all together. And that's what we got. Al Gore came to the rescue with sustainability. That's what the S stands for.